and then we're going to go ahead and get started so that we're not falling too, too far behind. All right. So while you're um, adding in the chat where you're from, I also want to kind of go through what are your current challenges when working with subject matter experts? I want you to drop that in the chat as well so that I have an idea of what your current challenges are as we going through uh, the presentation today. Okay, yeah, scope creep is a big one. Not providing effective feedback, yes. Deadlines, oh, that is definitely a good one on both ends. Not being responsive, boundaries, okay. Yeah, this is helpful, so I really appreciate this. Okay, yeah. All right, so as we're going through, um, I'm hoping by the end of this session, you will be able to identify the power skills needed when working with subject matter experts, um, determining your approach to building that rapport with SMEs, um, articulating your design and development process, setting expectations for SMEs, and then also um, formulating your escalation process um, for disengaged. Um, I know that a lot of people have been saying um, not being responsive, so we wanna make sure that we have some type of protocols in place as well. All right, so let's get started. So power skills, this is um, my preferred terminology for soft skills, FYI. Um, so having employees with these uh, so-called hard skills is valuable because they find solutions to technical problems. So that's usually the hard skills. Um, however, um, crisis or unexpected situations are solved through a combination of the hard skills, which are these skills and the powered skills. And these power skills are the attributes or capacities that allow a person to perform um, their job more effectively. And these skills are um, personal attributes that improve per, um, people's ability to, re to relate to one, uh, one another, I'm sorry. All right. So power skills, examples of power skills include teamwork, problem solving, time management, handling change, handling stress, leadership, effective communication, active listening, and empathy. Um, but I do want you to drop in the chat, of course, there's others there, um, but what other skills can you um, list that could be applied when working with SMEs as well that I did not list in this, um, this slide? Humor, yes, that's a good one. Patience, for sure. Project management, yes. See patience again. Emotional intelligence. Absolutely. Flexibility, yes, being agile is important as well. Yeah, these are great. Patience is really high up there. <laughs> Trust building, yes, that's important as well. Okay. Calmness, being present, yeah. I can appreciate that as well. Okay, so First things first, we wanna see how we can actually develop these skills um, because clearly that is possible as well. And we wanna do that first by practicing self-awareness, um, really taking the time to get to know your strengths and your areas of improvement. Um, and I'm sure um, you all are all familiar with um, the many tools out there um, that is available to assist you um, but ultimately, you're simply going to want to reflect on certain situations and how you reacted. Really asking yourself, did I handle that well? What I um, could have done better? And again, taking the time just to understand um, who you are. Next, we're going to discuss asking for feedback. So those near to you often have a pretty good sense of your power skills. Um, so please do not be afraid to ask for their opinion um, when seeking feedback. It's a way of like earning other people's respect as it shows your value and what they think of you. Um, what is really important here is being open to that feedback as well. I actually took a training um, not too long ago that kind of dove into how to receive feedback. I know that a lot of trainings right now kind of focuses on how to provide it. And they offer techniques, which um, it was like six of them. It was make it about growth, um, expecting 
blind spots. So you can only see your behavior through someone else's eyes. Um, three was normalize uh, receiving feedback. So you are not the first person and you, you won't be the last person to receive it. Um, depersonalizing it. So focusing on the task and the objective, not the person in which um, you're receiving it from, because I know we all have our own biases around that. And then focus forward. The longer you look back, the sooner you will trip up. So you want to always look ahead and then staying in the driver's seat. Like it is your feedback and you ultimately make the decision on what to do with it. Third is investing in yourself and what are, whatever that might look like for you. And that could be enrolling in a course, reading a book, attending the learning exchange, hey, hey, um, or joining a community of practice within like a professional organization. Um, and remember that investing in yourself is not always a financial commitment. I know that I mentioned like reading a book, for example, so it could just simply be investing in your time. And lastly, um, looking to a coach or a mentor is a great way to really get honest, productive feedback. Um, it's often best to find someone outside of the normal channels um, you can really, who can really help you identify the areas that you need to focus on. So probably not your best friend <laughs> um, or a sister or brother, but really someone who you could um, kind of seek that uh, that feedback from. And I, I definitely would suggest interviewing potential coaches and mentors to understand their approaches and really take the time to share exactly what you're looking for in that coach or mentor. All right. Next, we're going to talk about um, building rapport. So in order to do that, you have to know exactly what it means. And rapport is defined as a friendly, harmonious uh, relationship. And there's mutual agreement, understanding, and empathy that makes the communication flow well. So depending on the nature of your role, you might lean on rapport and relationships um, quite heavily. So there are six tactics you can take to strengthen your relationships. And the first one, of course, is to make a good introduction. And making a good first impression starts with the small things, um, for example, like a firm handshake, a smile, um, maintaining solid um, eye contact, or even remembering the person's name. Um, I know that that's something that's important for me. I try and make sure that Lucretia is said clearly so that everyone knows how to state my name. I mean, it really does make me feel um, good uh, when someone actually tries. So your first impression will set the tone for literally the rest of the conversation or project. And eventually that respect and communication you built with the person um, would grow as well. So it is clearly important to be aware of um, how you're showing up in that first impression moment. Two, you're gonna wanna actively listen, um, making sure you're putting on your listening ears, being an active listener and paying close attention to that conversation. Um, and this leads into the next tactic as well, which is asking engaging questions while you're actively listening. Uh, we've all been in those one-sided conversations um, that's asking, uh, engaging in thoughtful questions is so important. That's why asking um, engaging in thoughtful questions is so important. So you're going to want to think about the core of like what you would really like to know, like what do you need to know? And like, what are you hoping to, to learn um, in this as well? So what sort of questions will allow you to set a strong foundation for a relationship, um, your goals? And then once you've decided what you'd like to get out of the, um, the conversation, you could form those appropriate questions to match it. Then you have the body language. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to be aware of your body language. Um, your nonverbal communication is just as important as your verbal communication and your nonverbal cues are essential to um, building rapport. So this includes things like eye contact, um, facial expressions and being aware of distractions like your phone. I know that for me, I have to flip my phone over um, when I'm in a meeting or in this current situation as well, because once the notifications get the coming, my eyes get the wandering, and I wanna make sure that um, everyone has my undivided attention. Next is finding commonality. So it can be easy to assume that you don't have anything in common um, with someone based on the first or second sentence or immediate um, interaction. 
Uh, but as you get to know someone better, of course, you'll find some sort of shared experience, characteristic, or even perspective. And lastly, you're going to want to lead with empathy and respect. And this is tying back to those power skills as well. A strong, healthy relationship is built on empathy and respect and are key components to building trust. And I know that was something that was discussed in the chat early as well, um, building trust. So all in all, building rapport is important um, because it establishes trust, um, trust. It can help to improve your business performance um, and it could strengthen your social connections as well. And I think I forgot to mention that if you have questions, of course, please drop, drop them in the Q&A um, chat. I will definitely get to it at the very end, um, but uh, please do that so that we can keep track of everyone's questions. All right. Next. We are doing discussing your process. So when discussing your process with SMEs, um, it is important to note that the design and development process is very much so different for each individual and the organization. Um, and it also depends on if you are an entrepreneur, so someone who is free freelancing as well. So after you have determined your best approach, um, it is up to you to communicate that to your SMEs. So before I get into a full blown out, um, discussion of the process, I do want to do a quick like instructional design 101 type thing and discuss like the three common models um, when it comes to instructional design. And the first one, of course, is Addy, which is our classic ISD model, um, which uses steps as the foundation for almost any learning design. It is based on and named uh, for the five elements of ISD, which is analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. And this, again, is the standard when it comes to models. Um, then you have SAM. Um, and SAM is an iterative and incremental development uh, process that allows requirements and learning solutions to really evolve through collaboration with the stakeholders. Um, it really fosters uh, the creation of learning with real project um, constraints by making repeated steps or iterations to uh, continuously move closer to the best possible uh, product with each milestone. And then lastly is that ag agile model or um, LLAMA, which lot like agile methods approach, which is really funny to me that that's what they came up with. Uh, but this method actually originated from software development. Um, it is collaborative effort by cross-functional teams and it focuses on maximizing customer value and is highly flexible and interactive. Um, it also involves um, solutions by sharing prelim preliminary elements with stakeholders and piloting uh, certain solutions and then collecting feedback at different stages throughout the process. So of these three, I do have a poll that I want to launch here and you should be able to see it. I'm just curious, which of these models are you currently using? And if it's something different, like other than, uh, please definitely put that in the chat because I'm curious to learn um, your processes as well. Okay, Julie had stated that she used both Addy and Sam. I guess it depends on the project. Okay. Don't forget that if you're putting other, please drop in the chat what other um, tools you're using. I am most definitely curious. I'm seeing Addy and Agile and a little bit of Sam. <laughs> okay. Sam and Agile. Okay. Someone has used all of them. <laughs> okay. Addy seems like to be the same. Well, an Agile. Yes. I have used an agile version of Addy myself. It's a very systematic process um, for sure. So sometimes it might need some tweaking here and there. Okay, great. 
Great, great, great. I was just curious uh, about that. So that is helpful to know. Um, but yes, like I mentioned, I um, kind of use some version of Addy in my role. Um, and I'm using it as an example here. So this is what I meant by um, showing the SMEs where exactly they would fall in the design and development process. It's really highlighting their involvement. So like your analysis phase would pretty much be that intake, um, really gathering all the information, understanding the audience, the goals, the learning objectives, um, and everything of that nature. They're clearly involved there depending um, if they are the requester. Then there's the kickoff meeting. Of course, that is usually where everyone is coming in um, to really discuss what their vision was um, when they made the request in the beginning. And also for you as the designer um, or learning strategist to really state what it is that you would do and um, how you would involve them throughout and what the ultimately the end goal would be. Of course, storyboarding, that's all you. Um, depending on, again, the model that you chose, you might have a SME review at this point so that they can see where you are um, in the process, um, provide that feedback, because I know that's important to us as well. Um, if there are any immediate changes there, we would hate to finish it. Um, and then you change your mind at the very end. So. This is an important stage, especially for me, is really getting their, um, their feedback and input at this storyboarding stage. Um, then, of course, development, that's all you. Um, depending if you're working on a team or if you just respect someone's opinion and their feedback, you might do a peer review. Um, and then ultimately, you might go back to this me to show them, like, this is the draft. Um, and if they have any additional feedback there. Um, based on what was decided at the storyboard until the development. So again, showing that and then deployment and then evaluation. Um, and evaluation, it's different at every organization. And depending, again, if you're doing freelancing, um, how involved you are in that stage is ultimately up to you. But this is just an overview of how I would kind of display where this SME is actually involved in the process. So clearly these are, it just looks like a lot of steps. Clearly you may not need to involve this me as often, but it's just a quick snapshot of like, okay, this is what I'm pretty much including you in and how much involvement you would be. Um, and this kind of leads into that setting SME expectations also, uh, which we are going to get into next. All right, so. Subject matter experts can be anywhere, um, but there is one thing that they all have in common and they're usually the go-to person um, in their department. Uh, if you're asking around and people keep mentioning the same name, then you've probably found your subject matter expert. Sometimes we are lucky uh, as designers um, and the SMEs are kind of assigned prior to the start of the project and we're not having to be the ones to go and seek out um, who that could be, but there have been instances um, where I had to locate a SME based on a, like I identified business need or goal. So just to keep that in mind, when you are searching, um, there are some things that you um, want to look for when you are selecting a subject matter expert. Okay, so what should we do to set SME expectations? Of course, we're gonna to want to define the commitment. Previously, we've shown like where they might be involved, but what does that actually entail? So we want them to be prepared um, and you descri describing what that role is in the three categories of tasks, expectations, and skills. And this, again, goes back to like the design process. Um, what is needed for a SME review? Like what skill set do you need to bring to the table? Okay, so you're gonna wanna ask um, questions, of course, as I mentioned, when you're really um, deciding on a SME. And the first question is, do they have the time? Um, when you're describing what task will be done and when, um, if you are getting a lot of resistance around that time, you may need to reconsider uh, who your subject matter expert is. Um, next question is, do they have the expertise? 
Uh, if deep complex knowledge is required, please ensure that your subject matter expert can provide you what you need. Um, because some people can be an expert in the field, but they're not great at knowledge transfer. So just make sure that um, that person can actually provide you the information that you need to create the product. What will they be expected to deliver? So are you expecting your subject matter expert to sit in virtual meetings, for example, to have monthly meetings, weekly meetings, whatever have you, um, or would you expect them to create content? Um, again, depending on the type of project you're working on. If it's an e-learning, are you gonna um, want them to write an e-learning script um, for you to record? Or will they be the ones recording it? So just make sure you are completely clear about the commitment um, involved. Um, next question will uh, just be, will just one subject matter expert um, be enough? And the easy answer will just be like, great, yes, I only have to work with one person. Um, but if you think your course topic um, may overlap in several areas and it might be a lot for one person, you might want to consider uh, involving more than one SME um, to make it easier again on that individual. Um, of course, like I said, it might be easier to work with just one person. Um, I will say that I've had my fair share of experience working with multiple SMEs and coordinating that can be severely complex. Um, but you also kind of kind of soak in a variety of perspectives and then also you can deliver potentially richer materials. Um, next is when does their involvement end? Um, so don't anticipate that the um, SME's involvement will be uh, front loaded. Just here's the information, peace out, nice knowing you, I'll see you at the end. Um, you're really gonna want them to be a stakeholder throughout the entire project and also identify what that ending is. So again, I know that we mentioned deadlines. If there are deadlines for specific um, things, you're gonna want to state where the SME would need to kind of provide content if necessary. Um, and potentially saying that's the ending of that phase. I may not need you until the next phase. Or if there is a hard deadline for when this is set to launch, then that will be when the actual relationship will end. Um, so is it at implementation um, or are you assisting with, again, maintenance or evaluation? So making sure that you're having that conversation. Okay, so. SMEs are oftentimes the busiest of people, and we know this, they clearly have other priorities there, um, and developing learning materials are not always um, at the top of their list. So it is ultimately up to you to have a communication plan in place to ensure that the project is moving along. Um, if you do run into a problem and encounter a disengaged um, subject matter expert, you must have an, an escalation process. It is crucial, 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 um, because at that point, the project will just die in silence um, and you're not going to have any idea where to go from there. So definitely have that in place. And I'm going to share with you all um, just an example um, escalation process. Um, So for example, so after sending emails or setting appointments with no responses, week one might look like reaching out to the SME directly again to confirm receipt of the, um, the sent emails. Or if you schedule a, schedule a meeting, I know that I have scheduled many meetings and I've had no shows. So that happens too. Uh, so that could just be like a week one situation. Um, skipping ahead might be like a week three, depending. You might reach out to your supervisor to com communicate that concern. Um, again, if you're a contractor, freelancer, entrepreneur, of course, you may skip this step. You might go str straight directly to the person who requested it if it's different from the person, um, the SME who you're working with. And then week five might look like sending an email to the sponsor communicating that the project is pretty much inactive, on hold, and um, you provide that docu documentation to support this, this um, decision. So if you have those emails, 
you can kind of add them to that thread or you can have a running documentation of like what you have done um, so far and why you were not able to com like continue on with the project and or why you have not been able to meet those deadlines or reach those milestones. So that's everything in a nutshell. And I do want to kind of review um, two scenarios with you. And I want you to pull from what you what we kind of discussed today, as well as your own experiences, because of course we're learning from each other as well. So here's the first scenario and I'm gonna read it aloud. Um, SMEs are oftentimes, again, the busiest of people and developing learning materials is not always their top priority. As you are working on your project, you realize that it has been harder to schedule meetings with your assigned SME and they are not completing the requested tasks. You are essentially not getting what you need in order to move forward. Using the chat, what will be your next step? So fire it away. I'm curious what will be your next step in this current um, scenario. <laughs> Throw hands. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes, yes, I have wanted that for myself. Okay, yeah, I'm telling on them. Okay, maybe it's a scheduling thing. I know with global uh, teams as well, that could be an issue. So making sure that you're accommodating everyone's availability. Okay. Go above their heads. So it's that escalation process you're pulling from, um, from that. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Reach out to this meet to check um, if scheduling is an issue. Okay. Competing priorities. Absolutely. There's always going to be competing priorities. What I always say when working with SMEs, if something comes up, please communicate that effective communication, right? You want to make sure that we are being honest with one another and sharing those details. If something is now being delayed, we're going to want to make sure that that's shared with the people that's involved in the project team. Establishing a completion goal for each meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Having those next steps um, shared as well. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm loving it. Yeah, so for sure, a lot of uh, what you all are saying is implementing that escalation process. Like we're going to reach out one more time. Maybe something's not working. Um, so let's kind of reevaluate what that might look like. If that still isn't working, yeah, I'm going to tell my supervisor. Yeah, I might tell the person who there who is their superior or whoever is that core sponsor or person involved. Absolutely. I'm going to want to kind of will them in. So, yay. Love it. Love to see it. All right. Number two. A core sponsor reaches out and requests a training for their department that they feel will save the business a lot of money. You are assigned two SMEs to work with to build out this training. You realize that as design conversations begin, more and more people are a part of the conversation and the project is getting derailed by competing priorities. I know that was something that was stated last time. So using the chat, what do you think happened and what would be your next step? <laughs> Let's go, I love it. <laughs> Speak with the person to find out what the challenge is. Yeah, readjust, absolutely. I have had um, to kind of include my supervisor in certain meetings as well. Absolutely, it might definitely be um, an issue with the scope of the project. Perhaps the, the goal wasn't identified in the beginning. Ask for one point of contact, yeah. Clearly it's getting derailed a little bit. We're gonna try and wheel it back in. Too many people are involved. Like I said before, um, depending on the project, you might need multiple people. Um, 
But again, you're going to have to coordinate that in a way that it makes sense for the project. If there are too many th different things, and as mentioned before, the scope trying to get a little out, out there, <laughs> um, definitely wanting to wheel back to, to decide who that one person might be or, or two even. Yeah, revisiting the objective, absolutely. Everything usually ties back to the objective. Yes, identify the decision maker. So yeah, that's what I was saying as far as if you're the one who saw at, like saw after the SMEs, um, then you ultimately was the person who sought after them. But usually there is someone assigned and if they do not have the answer, for example, they're just like, oh, we can just bring in such and such. And it's just like, hmm, question mark. Do we need to bring them in or can you just ask them the question? <laughs> so we're gonna wanna make sure that if you do not have the answer, just kind of communicate that we wanna keep the, the project team as is, but if you need outside resources, I am happy to, to reach out to them. Yeah, creating a statement of work. Yes, absolutely. Responsibility chart, yeah. Yeah, a team charter is usually um, really good <laughs> uh, in the beginning, like in that kickoff meeting, really, again, stating the roles, the expectations, um, and what everyone is expected, again, to do when um, communicating that. So yes, RACI, project management, love it. That helps with uh, deadlines, milestones and could see everything in a snapshot on screen. So I love that idea as well. All right. Perfect. Love it. So with that, um, there are actually several, and I'm going to drop this in the chat as well, in uh, on LinkedIn that has other tools that you can use, like different scenarios you could view. Um, to kind of practice those skills in, of like what you would do next. Because with that, um, it's pretty much the end of my session. Um, and by the end, you should now be able to, again, identify those power skills that you might need um, when working with SMEs, determining your approach to building the rapport um, when working with subject matter experts, articulating your design and development process, whatever that might be setting those expectations and formulating your escalation process when you encounter um, disengaged SMEs. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can be fully present in the room um, and I wanna open it up for Q&A. So if there are any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A um, section. I would love to answer anything for you. I think we have about 10 minutes for that. So happy you all were able to enjoy it and learn something from it. So I am happy about that. All right. So it doesn't look like we have many questions. So with that, I want to make sure that you all um, just as a reminder to check your inbox on Monday on June 26th for the post-event survey. Um, also, uh, just so that we can kind of gather the feedback, of course, we, we value it. Um, and in doing so, you could win one of two $50 cash, cash prizes and check your spam because it might be there too. Um, and I think my LinkedIn was kind of dropped in the chat uh, a couple of times. So I want to do that as, um, so that we could stay connected. And it looks like we have one question, like what if the stakeholder claims a tight turnaround, but the timeline becomes tight because of scope creep? Yes. Um, so I've actually just experienced this. Um, so this past December, um, they've asked that this training be developed to help uh, with a business goal, and they wanted it completed by February. February came around, and they had no idea uh, 
what exactly they wanted. And again, that same scenario, that, that number two, that was me. <laughs> I had several people coming in, um, claiming to be the experts in certain um, aspects of the training, and then the whole scope got derailed. And what I had to do was, again, schedule that meeting with the core sponsor, the individual who scheduled it, and ask them, who exactly am I working with so that I can meet not this deadline because it's impossible at this point, but to meet the next deadline. And in her identifying the two individuals um, for each section of that training that I created, I was able to kind of not block out or ignore, but really focus in on the content that I was receiving then. And then ultimately being able to kind of realign and readjust so that we can um, ultimately um, design to the initial scope. So I hope that answered your question, Patrice. Awesome. I don't think we have any other questions. But it definitely um, was a pleasure.